Well, it's good to be back, and it's good to see all of you here today. Lots of smiling faces. Yes? yes? I said smiling faces. <laughs> there you go. I like that. <laughs> all right. Uh, it's good to be back. It's good to be worshiping with uh, the, the family again, and uh, we just uh, feel refreshed and ready to go. And today we're going to be starting a whole new series. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts for several weeks. <laughs> we're going to be doing a chapter by chapter investigation uh, into the Acts of the Apostles, into the infancy of the church. And sometimes we're going to look at the whole chapter, kind of like we're doing today. Sometimes we're going to just pick out one event or a couple events within the chapter and highlight those. But either way, you're going to know what to read ahead of time and what to be studying ahead of time so that we can delve a little deeper into the Scripture so that we can investigate and explore God's Word together, all right? You're going to know what next week's sermon is about because we're doing it chapter by chapter, okay? And so we're going to see what it's like for the disciples in this infancy of the church to say, what's next, Lord? What's next, Lord? The Holy Spirit is, is, is wanting to do a work in them. Jesus, when he was with them after his resurrection, he breathed into them and said, or breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And we're going to read about today a little bit more about the Holy Spirit and God's intention for the Holy Spirit in our lives. But we want to see, we want to follow the adventures and the acts of the apostles. And we want to have that same sense of expectancy and urgency and, and a, a sense of excitement about what's next, Lord. Not, oh, what next, Lord? Like, you know, what, what other thing is going to happen to me? But what's next, Lord? What's the next step? The next step what, what is it that you want us to do next? Where are you taking us? Step by step, we know what you've called us to do. How are we going to do it? How are you going to work this out in our lives? We want to experience all you have for us, God. So what's next, Lord? We want to live as spirit-filled Christians Christians with something to offer in a world that is empty-handed. How empty-handed is our world? Did we get the... There it is. How empty-handed is the world? This is an actual Facebook marketplace ad, okay? This guy is selling nothing. Nothing. And for $85, yes. $85. I saw that. I just started laughing. I, this is great. <laughs> and in the, the description, he says, this is more for collectors. I got a decent deal when I bought it. Just don't need it anymore. <laughs> it's, it's in good condition. So no low balls. I know what I got, and I will not respond to, is this available? Serious inquiries only. <laughs> Serious inquiries only for nothing at $85. Well, I did contact the guy. <laughs> I said, dude, this is hilarious. I said, would you be willing to come to our church service when I preach, and I'm going to use this in my sermon, I said, would you be willing to come and demonstrate what you have to offer 
for $85. I said, he's over in Indiana. I said, I'll even pay for your gas and take you out to lunch. And, and he said, well, unfortunately, he said, I have to work on Sunday, so I can't make it. So I told him, that's too bad, because between the gas money and the lunch, you just might have made $85. <laughs> he said, LOL, I hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> How empty is the world? They have nothing to offer, nothing for $85. <laughs> we, as Christians, we have something to offer. And the early church, with a minimal blueprint and a passion for Jesus Christ, these first-generation Christians lived with great expectancy. And then they kept saying, what next, Lord? What next, Lord? If you like adventure, if you like TV shows that have adventure in them, oh, you're going to love the book of Acts. Lots of action. In fact, it's called Acts, okay? So that gives a, a, little, uh, a little hint. There's action in this book. It's adventurous. The disciples are going on this adventure in the Spirit of Christ. So what's next? Empowered by the Holy Spirit, they would eagerly face each new day with an attitude of, what's next, Lord? So let's read Acts chapter 1. We're going to read the whole chapter, okay? So, Luke writes, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which, he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. Okay, Jesus had spent 40 days. And so the day of Pentecost, as we know it, when the Holy Spirit came, was 50 days. So Jesus was saying, in a few days, in only what, 10 more days. The Holy Spirit is going to follow, and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> we just spent a, a whole month series on to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They were all continuing, continually united in prayer along with the women 
including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who were together was about 120 and said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David foretold about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was one of our number and shared in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell head first, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field is called Hakaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling become desolate, no, let no one live in it, and let someone else take his position. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, taken up from us, from among those, it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Notice one guy had three names. I don't know if we should trust that guy. Three names. <laughs> Got aliases. Then he, they prayed, you Lord, you know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. All right, that's a lot to, to digest, isn't it? We're going to focus on the word one today. What's next, Lord? One. Step one. Step one. In verse 4, there is one final command. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. Stay. Wait. Stop. Stop what you're doing. Don't get ahead of yourselves. Wait. Psalm, what is it? 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Stop. Wait. Be still. Oh, how many times as a hyperactive kid did I hear my mom say, David, be still. Just be still for five minutes. Just be still. Stop what you're doing. Wait. Stop. Please, quiet down. Be still. And that's the, that was the command that, the Holy, or that, that Jesus gave his disciples. Stop. Wait. Hold on. Other versions of that uh, uh, that of Psalm forty six say, "Stop striving," or "Stop fighting" as a way of getting your point across. Just stop what you're doing. On one hand, the apostles and Jesus' family they were scared. They were hiding from the the Romans in in fear for what retribution might come their way because they thought, well, these disciples must have come and stolen Jesus' body and they're making us look bad. So they were kind of fearful of the Romans and what might happen. But they were also, on the other hand, they had exciting news to tell. This Jesus who they had followed, everybody had seen him crucified. They had seen him die on the cross. They saw the, the Roman soldier put a spear in his side and a mixture of blood and water came out 
signifying that, yes, he was dead. And then he was buried. And the stone was rolled over across the grave, and two Roman soldiers were posted there to guard it. So everybody knew that he had died. Everybody knew that he was buried. And now they have this exciting story that Jesus had risen from the dead. And it wasn't just them who had seen him. He had been seen by over 500 people over a period of 40 days. He's walking around. Everybody is able to see him. This is not something that they've made up. They have exciting news to tell. But Jesus is saying to them, hold on, wait. Oh, you know, there's fishermen among this group of disciples. You know, fishermen. And those fishermen, they wanted to, I mean, they were chomping at the bit. They wanted to tell people about the one that got away from the Romans. But Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem. Wait for the promise that the Father has given to us. This promise that I've told you about. Back in John chapter 14, Jesus said, while I'm here, I'm teaching you many things. He says, but... One day, the counselor whom the Father is going to send to you, he's going to come and he's going to remind you of all these things that I've taught you. This is the promise of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit from the Father. You're not ready just yet. Stay. Wait. Stop what you're doing. Be still. The Father has something more for you. Wait just a little longer. Oh, remember how antsy we got during the COVID lockdowns? Oh, yeah, I was pastoring a, a church in, in Kentucky at the time, and a smaller church than this, and so I had to work on the side, and so I got hired on to be a part-time bus driver. Ooh, woo And then as almost, I got, I got hired in January of 2020. Yeah. So you know what happened. Everything got shut down. We weren't allowed to do anything. We weren't allowed to, to meet with our coworkers and get the training and everything that we needed. How antsy did we, did we get? Oh, my goodness. And after six months of doing nothing, I got a raise. <laughs> I knew I was good at doing nothing. <laughs> it was just their policy. After six months, you stick with them, you got a raise. So I got a raise for doing nothing. But I was, as excited as I was about getting a raise, I was antsy. I wanted to actually do some work. You may have felt the same. Oh, yeah, it's, we're doing nothing, but oh, just, I want to get out and do something. I want to go back to work. I want to, you know, see family. I want to do things. And then we all found out we could go to Lowe's or Home Depot, and suddenly we all had work to do at home, right? <laughs> all of us, our, our honey-do list got, uh, got filled up pretty quick there, okay? We were all working, but it was at home. Well... Jesus' last command was to wait. Oh, kind of makes you antsy. Wait, wait, wait. Wait in prayer, he says, until I say you're completely ready. Are you ready? What's next, Lord? Are you ready for what's next? Are you? If not, wait patiently, and pray earnestly. Do you hear me? Wait patiently and pray earnestly. Don't do nothing. <laughs> 
for six months. Pray, fill the time with prayer. Pray earnestly as these disciples did. Then in verses 5 through 8, we see one final promise. One, one final promise. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days, he says in verse 5. And then in verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. One final promise. And how would they know that they were completely ready? How would they know when the Father's promise was fulfilled? When the Father delivered on His promise? When the Holy Spirit would fill them and flood them and move them? When the Holy Spirit overwhelmed them with spiritual power, then they would be ready. Are you ready? I ask you again, are you ready? If not, wait and pray. Get ready to be ready, okay? The Holy Spirit is coming. Beginning in Jerusalem, they were going to be effective witnesses. What were they getting ready to do? They were getting ready to be effective witnesses in Jerusalem. All right. That's where we are. There's lots of Jews here. All right. We're going to let all the Jews know that Jesus is the Messiah. We're ready. Okay, let's go. And in Judea, Okay, yeah, we'll go out to the countryside as well, to the, to the territory that's owned and, uh, and occupied by, by the Jewish people. Yeah, we're, we're ready for that. And Samaria. Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Samaria, those people are only half Jewish. We, we don't really associate with them. Those are those weird cousins. We, we don't talk about them. Samaria. Okay, if you say so. Samaria, okay. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And to the ends of the earth. Now, wait a minute. Those are Gentiles out there. They don't have any Jewish blood in them. They don't have any rights to, to, to be heirs of Abraham. They're Gentiles. You want us to include those, those barbarians who live in northwest Ohio? Yeah, those guys too. But Lord, they eat ham. They're Gentiles. They eat ham. And not only do they eat ham, they put ketchup on their ham. <laughs> Hayden, I'm sorry. I got to apologize to you. We were at, he doesn't even know I did this. We were at a dinner, and there was ham. We were making ham sandwiches, and I saw Hayden make his ham sandwich, and then he reached for this red liquid, and he put ketchup on his ham sandwich. And at Jennifer Koski was in line right in front of me, and I said, Janet, did Hayden just put ketchup on his ham? She said, Yeah. And I said, what an utter Philistine. <laughs> Pastor Dave, I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> so when I got to my table and I was sitting with people, I said, I can't believe what I just saw. Hayden put ketchup on his ham. I go, that, that's, just, that's just not done. And, I, and I'm digging a hole. I'm digging a hole. I'm, I'm doubling down on this, you know. 
And Tammy was sitting next to me, and she just waited for me to dig and dig and dig. And she waited until I was done, and then she pushed her plate a little closer to me, and she just opened up her sandwich. And guess what? There was ketchup on her ham. <laughs> and I felt about this small. <laughs> oh, God wants this, the, the gospel to go to even to northwest Ohio, where we eat ketchup on ham, I guess. <laughs> but yes, we are promised the filling of the Holy Spirit. We're promised to be overflown with, flowing with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to saturate, He's going to baptize us, He's going to fill us, He's going to overflow us, He's going to saturate every cell of our being and give us the power and the holy motivation that we need to speak boldly for Christ. Boldly for Christ. To witness to His transforming work in our lives and what He can do for others. He can do the same for others that He's done for us. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. The Holy Spirit is not a spirit of fear. He's not afraid, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. The Holy Spirit who lives in you, who is alive and at work within you, is not afraid to do battle with Satan or any of his minions. Yes, Satan is powerful against us by ourselves. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, one of the Trinity, He is God. And Satan is no match for Him. Holy Spirit is not afraid of Satan. He's not afraid to do battle. The same Holy Spirit who hovered and moved across the whole face of the unformed earth in the beginning is not afraid to move in your life. He's not afraid to move in our community. He's not afraid to move us to do His work and His will. <laughs> I love you, Jimmy. <laughs> He's not afraid to go ahead of you, to go behind you, to be your left guard or your right guard, he is not afraid to protect you from any attacks or any arguments that you may encounter. The Holy Spirit is in you. He's not afraid. The same Holy Spirit that filled and empowered David, King David, when he was just a shepherd boy to fight Goliath, nearly nine feet tall, Little David, a teenage boy, was not afraid because the Holy Spirit had come on him and he was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not afraid to fight those kind of battles. The same Holy Spirit who empowered Old Testament prophets to speak truth to dangerous and evil kings. That same Holy 
Spirit is alive and at work within every believer here today. Are you a believer here today? Then that means you. The Holy Spirit is alive and at work in you. In you. In you. Everyone here today who is a believer has the Holy Spirit alive and at work in you. Hear me. The Holy Spirit is alive and at work in you. And the promise that he gives us is to fill and empower you to be witnesses for him. To everyone, everywhere. You are that light shining on a hill. You are the light of Christ. His light shines from within you. Let his light shine. Be bold in your testimony. Let your light shine before men. So that people can know your Father in heaven. You better be waiting and praying if you're not ready. Are you ready? Because the Holy Spirit is about to fall. The Holy Spirit will fall on you, and you need to be ready to receive all that He has for you. Ready or not, here he comes. The Holy Spirit wants to move in this congregation. The Holy Spirit wants to move in this town, in this region. He wants to move us to reach the nations. Did you hear me? I only heard one amen. Amen. <laughs> He wants to move us to reach the nations. Ready or not, here he comes. Wow, time's getting away. I've got three more points. <laughs> Can I do the same thing that Steve did a few weeks ago? Is there anybody here willing to give me five more minutes? <laughs> yeah, you're not going to fall for that one again, are you? Okay, third point, one angelic testimony. One angelic testimony in verses 9 through 11. The, the angels say, This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. <laughs> As if Jesus' command and his promise weren't enough, two angels then appeared to the disciples. Why did they have to come? If Jesus had, had commanded them and Jesus had given them a promise, wasn't that enough? Why did the, the, these angels have to give this testimony? Because when Jesus ascended, the disciples were standing there like some rubes, just staring up in the sky. Which way did he go? Which way did he go? You know? And the angels, even the way they, they addressed them, they called them men of Galilee, which was not necessarily a compliment, okay? Men of Galilee, they, they were from the, you know, the distant lands up north, you know, and uh, it was like somebody calling you today, is calling you a hillbilly or a swamp rat or, you know, <laughs> you know. It wasn't necessarily a compliment. And one commentator even says, the disciples always seem to be one step behind the surprising moves of God. Always just one step. Remember back in verse 6? or verse, verse 5, Jesus said, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. And you would think, oh, wow, that's exciting news. Can't wait for that, Jesus. 
And what did they say? <gasps> well, Lord, are you, are you going to uh, restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? They're still thinking about an earthly kingdom. I can imagine Jesus going, <laughs> they still don't get it. They still don't get it. He says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons the Father has set. It's none of your business. It's not for you to know. This is not something for you to concern yourselves with. It's neither here nor there. But the power of the Holy Spirit is coming your way. They were always a step or two behind. So the angels had to give this testimony to Jesus' promise. That Jesus was going to come back for us all just as he had promised, right? <laughs> and in a few days, that the Holy Spirit would fall on them. He's going to come back for us all, and, he, and they let the disciples know that Jesus will indeed return one day, just as he promised. The same way that he, they had seen him go up, he's going to come down. That promise is still true. The testimony of the angels is still true. Jesus will return. And if you look at the way the world is acting, you know it's coming soon. Everything points to fulfillment of the prophecies of his return more and more every day and we can begin to see how easily the other prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled will soon be fulfilled because what's left is right and what's up is down what's evil is good what's good is evil in this world the prophecies are coming true Jesus is going to return soon. The time is drawing close. Time is getting shorter and shorter. And that's why we need to be operating in the power of the Holy Spirit now. Now, folks. Get ready. The Holy Spirit wants to do a work in us. Get ready. Be waiting prayerfully. Be ready to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to work mighty things in His name, in Jesus' name. Then in verses 12 through 14, they, we see that they were one in heart. One in heart. They were all continually united in prayer. Eleven apostles plus the women who closely followed Jesus and others as well, and including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And it says all, they're all told there was about 120 there. And they gathered together just, just as Jesus had commanded them, and the whole group of them became one in heart. One in heart. By uniting themselves in prayer. How do we become one in heart? By uniting ourselves in prayer. Do you think our church needs to become one in heart? <laughs> I can tell you. If you don't recognize it, I can tell you. We need to become one in heart. We need to be all pulling in the same direction. As a pastor, I get pulled in a lot of different directions. We need to be all pulling in the same direction. We need to be achieving the same vision. We need to be one in heart. The way that we become one in heart, one in direction, one in vision 
is to continually unite ourselves in prayer. Unite ourselves in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray constantly. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It is God's will for you, for me, for all of us, to pray constantly. It is God's will for you to pray constantly. Don't forget to pray for our church when you're praying for yourself or your family. Don't forget to pray for our church when you're praying with a friend or a family member. Don't forget to pray for our church family, our church, when we're praying in the church service. When someone is opening our service with prayer, don't just sit there like a bump on a log. Actively participate in the prayer. Unite your heart with the one who is up front leading in prayer. Join in on that prayer. Say, yes, Lord, I agree. Let it be so. Be active in prayer. Constantly. Unite your heart in prayer with others who are also praying. For us as a church. And then finally, the last thing we see in this chapter, one apostle is selected. And the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This matter of selecting another apostle to replace Judas Iscariot. Many times when we preach from Acts chapter 1, we just kind of skip over that. You know, it's we, we want to focus on, oh, the promise of the Holy Spirit. We, oh, that's, we, that's what we want. But if you look at it, it's, it's verses 15 through 26. It's almost half the chapter. So why should we skip it? Well, there's that, that pesky little thing that we don't like to talk about, you know, that whole thing of... Mm, Casting lots, you know, talk about weird cousins and weird uncles. That's something we don't want to talk about either, you know. We don't want to talk about casting lots. So we often skip, it over, skip over it because it talks about it. Well, in the short period of time, in those 10 days while they were waiting, the early church had a board meeting. <laughs> Must have been Presbyterians or Methodists or something. I don't know. <laughs> they, they had a church board meeting, and Peter addressed the people there with this idea of replacing Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus and then went and killed himself. And they narrowed the choices down to two people, Joseph and Matthias. And then they prayed and they cast lots. And the lot fell to Matthias. Why would they cast lots? Wasn't that pretty much just like a game of chance? No, there's precedent for this in the Old Testament. As far back as Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The third book of the, of the Old Testament. Okay? All the way back in Leviticus, chapter 16, and according to BibleStudyTools.com, that's where I found this information, when Aaron was going to cast lots for the designation of two goats, quote, there was a vessel, box, or urn called Kalfi, 
And in it were two lots of box tree, two cubes or rectangular pieces of boxwood. The high priest shook the calfee or urn and took out the two lots, one on which was written for the Lord and the other on which was written for Azazel. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. The scapegoat was the one that was then to be released into the wilderness. The one for the Lord was the one to be sacrificed. Now, as we go back to our text here in Acts, it's important to note that they prayed first. They prayed first before they cast lots. You, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which one of these two you have chosen. And this follows and affirms the, um, the firm belief and the prayer of Solomon in, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its very decision is from the Lord. Because people would pray ahead of time and let the Lord decide. It was not their decision. It was the Lord's decision. They prayed first before they cast the lots. Now, however, however, <laughs> after this, after this time in Acts chapter 1, we do not see another instance of casting lots in Scripture because now the Holy Spirit is given in fullness and he reveals to us the heart of God and the hearts of men and women and so when we select leaders we can know what the heart of God is we can know what the heart of our potential leaders are the key the key is to pray and seek the Lord's will. To seek to know the hearts of our leaders before we now cast our foul lots, right? They cast lots, pulling one cube and another, they cast their lots, and we now cast our foul lots as we elect our leaders nationally, but even locally in the church. We select our leaders. When I came to visit and to interview, the leadership of the church voted. <laughs> they cast ballots after they had prayed and prayed and prayed and they believed that this was God's selection my wife and I prayed and prayed and prayed and we believed that this was God's selection for us and so when the ballots were cast they called us into the room and they said we have voted to call you to be our new lead pastor. And my wife was sitting in the chair in front of me and she just kind of looked up and she said, I don't think this is something we need to talk about, is it? <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was abundantly clear. The Lord had spoken to our hearts what his heart was, and what the heart of this church was. The key is to pray and seek to know the hearts of one another, to know the heart of God. So what's next, Lord? What's next? The apostles still weren't sure what was going to happen. They didn't even know what was happening right in front of them. How did they know what was going to happen in the future? But they did know to expect something. 
They did know to look to God for answers. And they obeyed the Lord's command to prayerfully wait in Jerusalem. And they believed in the Father's promise of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of the angels that Jesus would return. And they united their hearts in continuous prayer and sought the Lord's will for the work that was coming their way. What's next, Lord? What's next for grace? Do you have a sense of excitement? Do you have a sense of urgency in your heart to follow God? Do you have a sense of expectancy for what God is going to do in us and through us, for us, and because of us? Well, we've been waiting prayerfully for six months <laughs> since I got here. And now God has given us a vision for what's next. And that is to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. And he calls us to testify to his resurrection. To testify to his soon return. In the power of the Holy Spirit. Can't do it on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, rain down. Let your voice be heard. <laughs> oh, Holy Spirit, overwhelm us. Fill us. Flood us. Saturate us. We need the power of the Holy Spirit and we need to be united in prayer so that we can be united in heart and in direction and in vision. And so, let me ask you a couple questions in closing. Are you, are you filled with and working in the full power of the Holy Spirit? Are you working in the full power of the Holy Spirit or are you like an engine that is missing on one of its cylinders? Go a little, go a little bit, go a little bit. We need that tune-up. We need a tune-up. We need to get in line with the Holy Spirit. We need to get those get firing on all cylinders with the full power that is available to us. If you've got only four cylinders and you're missing on one, you're missing a little bit of power there. If you've got eight cylinders and you're missing on one, you've got seven that are firing, but one's missing. You still are missing on some power. We need to be working in the full power of the Holy Spirit. Prayerfully waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall. Begging, oh Lord, fill me with your Spirit so that we can get moving and do so in full power. And are you united with your brothers and sisters here today in heart, direction, and vision? Are you united with your brothers and sisters in prayer? What's next, Lord? Let's get ready. Because the, the train is about to leave the station. The next chapter, Acts chapter 2, and it's a bullet train. <laughs> Get ready. Get ready. Pray for the Holy Spirit's power to fall on you. Pray for the Holy Spirit to fill you and unite you with your brothers and sisters so that we can get on board and get moving for God. We're going to close with One of the songs that, that, uh, that we sang earlier, Francesca Batticelli's 
Holy Spirit song. If you feel that the Holy Spirit is calling to you, saying, you're not firing on all cylinders. You're not fully united with your brothers and sisters. And come on, let's pray. Let's get on our knees before God. Submit to Him and His Holy Spirit. Submit to Him and get united with our brothers and sisters. Get on board with the heart of God, with the direction that He's leading us, with the vision that He has for our church. So as we go ahead and play that song, let's bow our heads and just check our spirits. And if God is calling you, if you need to be filled with the Spirit, let's pray. Let the Holy Spirit fill this place by filling your heart as well. <laughs>